morning. I want to share with you uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, uh, Acts 2, uh, 42 through 47. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I, I love this verse um, mostly just because uh, I want to see a community like this. Um, and, and I want to see this in my own life. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but, but I would like to be a part of the Lord of the Rings uh, circle with Samwise Ganji uh, and Gandalf and Frodo and Legolas and uh, Aragorn and uh, Gimli and the Hobbits. Uh, I'd like to be like Clary or in Truby or even Weezer in the Steel, Steel Magnolias. Um, I, I want to be a part of the band of brothers. I want to have something more than just uh, myself, something that's uh, not surface but deep, something great or something uh, rich. And I think that's what um, I, that's what I see in Acts two. It's not this uh, simple relationship that's just a high, but it's something deep, something rich, something powerful. Um, we've been for the last couple of years have been um, uh, making this kind of a vision for our small group leaders. Something that uh, we wanted to challenge our leaders, that we want to be able to have meals together in small groups. Uh, we want to be able to sit down and invest in one another, to be able to, to read the word together. Um, but over the last couple of years, as I look at this passage, I, I wonder if this passage is really attainable. Um, it feels like a fairy tale. Uh, Holy Spirit, you, you can see kind of works in Acts 2. You think, okay, well, maybe this is just the work of the Holy Spirit in the beginning when the church is starting, and, and that's kind of what's going on. So, so maybe this isn't possible to have uh, what they have. And I, you know, as I think of that, I, I, I think that's not true because if you look at Paul, Paul brings this again uh, through his letters. His passion to the Philippians is amazing. And the Philippians' love back to him is so deep and rich. It shows uh, this great impact of Acts 2, 42 through 47. So, so why does it seem to be less attainable today? I don't know about you, but I feel like I don't see that often. Um, I, I don't see those deep relationships. I don't feel like I get that as much as I, I used to. Um, maybe it's because maybe it's, uh, it just takes a lot of work. Maybe it's we're too busy. Not in a good way. Maybe it's because we're afraid of getting hurt again. We've been hurt by people we've opened our hearts to. Maybe we never experienced friendship like that at all. Maybe we don't know as much as we think as being friends in a deep, rich relationship. On a whole, most, most of us want this deeper and rich relationship, don't we? I think if we're really... Uh, true to ourselves and humble and open, I think we all yearn for this. We know that this is what the church is supposed to be. Uh, this is like Acts 2 is what it's supposed to be, that we want to see this. I think God brought us in a relationship with him that we are made and created for him to be his, but to keep us from being sidetracked, uh, to be taken off the wrong path, um, to, to continue striving forward, he gave us one another as believers, to care for one another as Jesus had for all of us. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. God convicted me this a while ago. I was good at being friends with a lot of people, but I was never good at being deep with one person or opening up. And that person that has many relationships but never has somebody that's going to talk into their life, it comes to ruin. But it's that person, that friend who sticks closer than a brother. I, when I think of the relationship in the Bible, I, I think of Abraham, Lot, Ruth, and Naomi, Paul, and Timothy, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It goes down uh, the road. But the one that I see the, the most depth and richness is Jonathan and David. 
I love looking at these two and just uh, what God has done in them. And today, I just want to take some practical pointers. Um, it's not that this relationship gives us a five point on how we should be have rich and deeper relationships, but I think this does help to give some ideas to help us to grow a little closer. Um, so I, I hope as we look at this, it helps us to, to get connected to relationships that are similar to Act 2. Now, before I, I get started, I, I want to preface a few things. First of all, uh, the passages that we're going through are the same passages that Caleb uh, mentioned last week. It was part of uh, his series, and the, kind of the whole focus of this whole section, the main point, is that there's this uh, King Saul, the fall of King Saul and the rise of David. Um, that this whole section is that King David was, was brought king and uh, he kind of went his own way. He fought into envy. He out, fell into jealousy and fear. Uh, and then David was kind of giving this reign of kingdom as we're, we'll kind of get closer into that. Uh, but this, this story of Jonathan David is kind of a, a secondary. It's not the main focus. And so I, I hope we uh, kind of see that that's where it's coming from with Caleb last week. Um, and I also want to kind of clear the elephant out of the room if there is one. I don't think this is a relationship with Jonathan David or sexual in nature. Uh, this is a deep relationship that God has bonded. Um, I don't want to take too much, but I want to give you just a couple things that I've uh, read and looked at on these. Uh, in chapter 18, we'll see this love, they say, bonded between Jonathan and David. Um, we see also in chapter 18 this love of Michael. Now, he does marry Michael, and uh, we have Jonathan, but also there's a love of Israel and Judah that's stated in 18 as well. Uh, even in chapter 16, Saul says he loves David. Um, the author is setting up the fact that everyone around Saul loves David, except for Saul. Uh, there's kind of kind of clearing out the room that there's no conspiracy. There's not all these people who think um, that David is wrong. It's actually Saul and Saul himself. His closest people that love him uh, disagree with where he's looking at. So it shows that it's Saul's issue, not David. David didn't do anything wrong. There was no bad character trait that David did something. It was Saul himself. And so when you see this love, there's kind of this, this contrast between the love that, that all the people had for David and this anger and this rage and this jealousy that, that Saul had against David. Um, in chapter 20, uh, 41, uh, we see that David and Jonathan kiss. Uh, this kissing one another was used in the Bible a lot. If you look at uh, Genesis, it's used often between family and other people. David uh, kissed other kings and other people. It was a cultural issue. Um, I don't know if we told you this, but when we were in Kenya, uh, one of their cultural traditions is to hold other guys' hands. Uh, we were told to be uh, very aware of that. And being in America, you don't do that. And so it was very strange when somebody came up and grabbed my hand and wanted to hold it for a while. <laughs> and I'm not talking five seconds, I'm talking 30, 40, very uncomfortable. <laughs> but it was a cultural thing to say that I care for you, that I love you, that there's a relationship between us, there's something that I care for you in a brotherly way. And so uh, that kissing, I don't think, is, is taken in the right context as well. And in uh, uh, Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel 126, David is lamenting the loss of Saul uh, and Jonathan. He says, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. Uh, this is when Saul and, and Jonathan both died. Uh, and he says, you are very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than a woman. Um, there's a lot of speculation or, or reasons why they think that it, this is. Some people will say it's cultural. It wasn't the man and woman were as close. I don't know if I would go down that far. But I, I think as we all can look at what Christ sacrificed for us, that death on the cross and what he gave for us, it's far more superior than anything else that we can have as a relationship. And Jonathan and David kind of had that. David gave, or Jonathan gave his life over to him many, multiple times. He could have been killed so many times. And there's this relationship that, that meant so much. If somebody gave your life right in front of you, that's, that is never going to be taken away. It's different from a love from a woman, but it's, it's remarkable what they did, their sacrifice and their love. So those are just a few things. There's some great uh, books that Caleb has, and uh, if you have any more questions, we can talk about that. But I just wanted to uh, hit on that first. Um, so let's, let's start looking into our passage. 
Um, so, as we look at this, what, what, the question I'm asking is what practices can we put into uh, placing, uh, put into place for having rich relationships? So, the first one I would say is finding commonalities in the things of the Lord. Now, um, this seems, this can be kind of vague, this seems kind of simple, but I think this is a, a big part of this passage. Uh, when you're seeking the Lord, God puts people in your path that desires and interests that, that you do. Um, I know they kind of said this, and I don't know if I always agree, but they say, uh, I remember it was kind of the Christian dating thing to say that as you're walking with the Lord and not working and focusing on a woman, that person will come alongside you and, and you know, you're kind of going the same direction. And that's a good indication of somebody the Lord's uh, bringing into you. If there's common uh, there's commonalities that God kind of brings together. Um, so I, I want to show you the, the passage that we just talked about. It says uh, in 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 4, it says, After David had finished talking to Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit, uh, some say knit together uh, with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return uh, home from his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Um, so when we look at this, I, I think on the commonalities, I think we have to look back at the story of Jonathan uh, way before this. In uh, 1 Samuel 14, uh, 1 through 14, if you want to look there, you can. Uh, I'm not going to read this, but um, at that time, the, Phil the Philistines were going after Jonathan. Uh, and... Um, what happened was the Philistines were able to, to kind of raise the prices and all the, all the swords and all that. And so nobody had swords except for Jonathan and Saul. And so they're in these crevices or in these cliffs, um, kind of scared. Sounds similar as we get to David and Goliath's story. And uh, Jonathan says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up. And if they say to us that we're supposed to come up, uh, then we know that the Lord has given them to us. And we're going to go up and we're going to kill them. Uh, if he says, stay down here, we're going to come to you, then, then this isn't the time. And so uh, Jonathan, uh, they see Jonathan, the Philistines say, come on up, come on up. And so they, they climb up, him and his armor bearer go up uh, by themselves. One sword, notice, one sword. I don't, I, Saul didn't know what was going on. Uh, so they come and they kill 20 people. There's great faith that Jonathan had to take that day. Uh, he had to depend on God. He knew that if the Lord wanted this to happen, that it would have to be uh, the Lord's doing. And so he trusted in the Lord uh, in this situation. So I think if we, we kind of go forward to David and Goliath, we see a, a very similar story uh, when it comes to Jonathan and David. Um, Jonathan saw the same things in David that he saw in himself. He had a passion to trust God. He was a warrior. He knew if God said to go do something, he was going to do it. David had the same mindset. Uh, it was kind of a kindred spirit. There were similarities that they had, uh, that there was a bond that knit together. I don't know exactly what this bond looked like. God put it together. Um, you know, if it was just that, but there were some commonalities that they had with each other that just drew them together. Uh, a step of faith that they both had uh, that they took. This knit together, uh, David Samora says, knitting together was similar to the fatherly love in Genesis 40, 30. Uh, he says this attachment of knitting together was an inseparable devotion. Uh, they were like-minded in the things of God. So when we think of, of, of this, they, uh, first of all, they were central on God first and foremost. And as they were centered on God, that person came alongside and the passions that they had were shared by somebody that was similar to them as well. I have a, a friend that I've uh, started having accountability with, not just accountability, we meet together. Uh, he's uh, full time, uh, full time, he works full time, he is a part time pastor, he also works at a part time job. He has two girls, I have three. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, him and his wife, and my wife, his wife and my wife hang out. Um, their kids kind of hang out together. We love football. He's a Jets fan, so um, you yeah. can pray for that. Um, but one of the things is we started to get together, we started to talk once a while. It was his passion. He wasn't afraid to just... Talk about what was going on in his life. I don't know if you know me well enough. I hate surface conversations. I want to get deep. I want to know what's going on in your life. And I like people who are willing to do the same. And so my friend Dan would just kind of do that with me. And so 
we have kind of this kindred spirit. He has, comes from a, a different, a, kind of a similar background and um, kind of not charismatic, but just his desire to seek the Lord, to know him and to want to be closer. Uh, and there's some just similarities that have drawn us closer together, that we meet on a regular basis. We try to meet every week. Uh, we get together, we talk, we pray, um, we commiserate over uh, marriage and other issues and children and all that kind of fun stuff as well and walk through stuff together. Um, so kind of application, we're going to do these applications as we go. You know, you know, it's important for us and this is kind of practical, but we need to find other people that, that have similar hearts for the Lord in different ways. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's passions for ministry. Maybe some of you are, are kind of social worker focuses, and there's others that have the same. As you kind of get together, it can really draw you closer to certain areas. Uh, maybe it's uh, individually you have certain people that you can see together. Small groups. Uh, we put small groups together so that you can come together. Uh, there's a commonality because we're all here at Calvary Baptist Church together. Uh, we're in small groups because we want to grow together as a church. Uh, and so that's a place of commonality as well. One of my favorite places, I have two favorite places I'll give it to you. Um, one is, one of my favorite times is, uh, and it hasn't been as uh, great lately because I haven't been there, is our prayer times on Friday mornings. Uh, mostly it's because there's a, a several ladies that uh, have a passion to just want to see God do amazing things. And their faith in God and their prayer just, we kind of have a kindred spirit. When we all get together, there's just such an amazing opportunity to see God move and we love to get together and talk and pray and see God move and it's just a, a place where um, I, I get challenged and I grow and we challenge each other and it's a place where we feel comfortable to deal with uh, those things as well. Uh, the other place I like to go is fishing. Uh, Todd would tell you that uh, fishing is one of the most God-given rights and uh, abilities that God will give to us. Uh, being on a stream Sitting in front of the presence of God and praising Him while I can just sit uh, and listen is amazing. But to do it with other people uh, and be able to have some people that do that as well, it's, it's a wonderful time to be able to go out and just say, Hey, how's your walk with the Lord today? What's going on? It's, it's a commonality that seems simple. Maybe it's broidery. Maybe it's uh, you like going to restaurants for fun things and somebody else says it's fine. Commonalities that we can come together. But it's under... The embodiment of the Lord himself, that we're focused on the Lord first and foremost. And as we do these things, God will bring those things in as well. Number two, uh, to have those rich and uh, rich relationships, we have to have humility in our relationships. Um, 1 Samuel uh, 18, 3 through 4, we see Jonathan made a covenant with David um, because he loved him as himself. Uh, Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Jonathan's first act was to give something to him. Um, he was not looking at himself. Um, I, and I don't think this is a small thing. When you look at the passage in Numbers 20, 24 through 28, Aaron's clothes were given to the son, his son Eleazar before he died. 1 Kings 19, 19 through 21, Elijah gives his cloak to Elisha before he dies. It's almost like this sense of transferring their power. I'm not saying this is happening here, uh, but I am saying that, that this was significant. It wasn't something he was just giving him his, his rags and clothes. These are things as a prince he was given, and he gave it over uh, to David. He humbled himself and gave it over to him. This, this is like uh, giving your competition all you have so he will win and he becomes a greater champion uh, than you. Uh, I don't know how many remember um, Days of Thunder. Do you remember that movie? Does anybody know that movie? Racing car movie, Tom Cruise? Wow. Okay. Well, near the end of the race, there's this big battle between cars and the one car dies and uh, one of the owners says, you know what, I'm going to give you this car, and you just take it, I'm gonna, and they won. Uh, and, and they were humble, they gave it to him, they wanted to see him do well. Um, wow, that's, that's amazing that none of you know that. <sighs> anyway, um, well part of this is, uh, you know, he's putting himself below uh, for him. He's not looking to himself 
And David becomes king. His dad is no longer king. Uh, he, he will not be king himself. The luxuries and the power is no longer his or his family's. Uh, he gave up his career for the betterment of his kingdom. He was willing to step aside, and there was someone for someone who might do a better job. That's humility. Putting yourself aside for other people. Jonathan, uh, I, I, I want to kind of give you a passage here. Uh, Philippians 2, 3, 2 through 11. I'm giving you a lot of passages, so please uh, make sure you write them down. This one says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others in your relationship with one another. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And this is the mindset of Christ, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name of, as above all names. And we could go on in this, in this sense, but, you know, Christ gave himself over. He says, as, as we're to give ourselves over and not have selfish ambition is to live just like Christ did. Christ gave everything he had for us. He had the power to save himself. He had the power to do anything he wanted, but he humbled himself uh, for, our, for our good, uh, for the benefit of others. When we look at this, kind of applying this, kind of applying this uh, idea is... Um, you know, do we have humility to see gifts and abilities in others uh, be put to use um, and to put our own aspirations and desires for the betterment of the workplace or ministry at church? Um, if you are in a competitive environment at work, are you willing to take a back seat so somebody else can, uh, you know, grow and, and, and be given more than you uh, to humble yourself for, for the betterment of the company, the betterment of the church? I think this um, humility has to come first, but I think the second and third points kind of come together. We love one another as ourselves would be kind of the third one. Um, and it comes together, but the thing is we can't love unless we are humble first. We have to kind of be able to put ourselves aside uh, so that God can work in us and so that we can be used in the way he wants. And so that's why I kind of put those two together. Um, so this third one, uh, to be a rich relationship, means we love one another as ourselves. So, so what if Jonathan made his bond with David for his own betterment instead? Uh, what if he brought uh, him in so he could steal his ideas? Uh, what if he wanted to find his weakness so he could defeat him later? Um, I, again, I, I, you know, I wonder if Saul did that. You know, Saul brought him in, and, and, and it seemed like Saul wanted him close to know what he was doing. Uh, Saul had love for him at one point, but later didn't. So you wonder if, if that's kind of his mentality as well. But again, Jonathan, again, remember, he had a lot to lose. He, he had a lot to lose in this relationship uh, by giving up uh, Saul and going to David. Uh, but Jonathan does not, but he does the opposite with this passage. And I love this passage that we're looking at in uh, uh, 18. <coughs> Notice that it's Jonathan is the one that's, that's giving, uh, that, that makes this covenant. David doesn't do any of that. It's just Jonathan. Jonathan makes the covenant with him first. Jonathan is the one who gives him his armor to David. Jonathan is willing to serve David without any strings attached. There's nothing for him. There's nothing uh, that he was asking for at this point. Uh, he will later, but at this point, it was not about himself. There was nothing about Jonathan that was there. Everything that he should be focusing on, that he could lose his crown, his dad could be humiliated, all the things that could happen later, um, that, that, you know, this king is going to come and take his rightful place as prince to be king. He had all the right in the world to be jealous, but he didn't. He humbled himself and he put his, his um, desires and David's uh, desires above himself. So, so why? What, why is he motivated to do this for David? If we look back at, at this passage, we see the author saying this twice. He says, Jonathan was doing all of this um, because he loved David as himself. 
When he thought of his needs, he thought of David's needs. So when Jonathan was cold, he didn't go to himself and figure out how to take care of himself first. He went to David to make sure he was taken care of. Uh, when Jonathan was hungry, he was taken care of. He didn't look at himself to feed first. He went to David. This isn't in the scripture. I'm making this up. Um, when you are at home and you're hungry and you have kids, the first reaction is you want to feed your kids. You want to take care of the person next to you. Um, it wasn't about his needs at all. Every time his needs came up, he met the needs of David first. Jonathan could took care of him, and he would, and he would have said he he did not need <laughs> he did not come before David. He loved him as himself, and, and I think that's kind of an example of what it looks to love uh, so, someone as ourselves. We're putting the needs of others before us. We see these similarities in our, our Lord as well. He puts our needs above His own so that we can be saved. He sacrificed His life. Paid it for a cross for our benefit. We see that in the passage we read. Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. 1 John 3, 6, or 1 John 3, 16, by this we may know, we know love that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brother. John 13, 35, uh, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I love you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This love one another is, is a theme of this passage, the theme of Jonathan. Um, I think when I think of Jonathan and David, we always kind of think of the David aspect of this passage and all of this. Jonathan is the one kind of stepping up. He's the one that's uh, bringing everything forward. He's the one getting initiating, getting it started. When, when I think of this love, um, I told you I, I met this friend. Uh, I meet with my friend Dan, and, and I was kind of convicted by this section. I was convicted because recently we haven't got together recently because it was mostly just because of me. There were too much going on. I was, had a busy schedule. Um, uh, things were going on at home and family and sicknesses and other things were going on. And to, to, to make that hour time was difficult for the last couple weeks. And I, I realized what was going on. It was I wasn't looking for his needs. I was looking for my own needs. I was looking at what I needed to do and what had to get done. And I wasn't looking to him. He would call me every once in a while or he'd text me and say, how are you doing? I wasn't doing any of that. Um, I was thinking of myself. And I think we do that in relationships where we sit down and we um, sometimes we can take over conversations and, and spew everything about ourselves where we need to do sometimes. Uh, when we need to really listen and, and, and be still and be able to help others uh, in those places. I, I think it's easy for us to put ourselves uh, ahead of our church um, as well in, in the ministry needs and the other people. Um, we kind of think of what we have as the top priority. Uh, but Christ's priority was you first, and not the other way around. It wasn't him first, then you. It was you, then him. And so it's the same way with us. Um, so, so when you're meeting your friend, whose needs are you meeting? Are, are, are you there because you're thinking of him and that person or, the, or that woman to be with, to care for, to be there for them? Small groups uh, is in other places, too. Um, I want to be candid. Um, one of the hardest places for small groups almost every year and almost the largest issue that we have on a regular basis from our small group leaders is people not showing up. Um, and, and I wonder sometimes, and maybe this isn't true for all of you, but is it because we're there to feed ourselves? Uh, we're not going to think of the other person, we're going for ourselves. We, if we really were conscious of missing, we would realize, recognize that, uh, that other people are um, depending on us. What I mean by this is, you know, are we, what, I understand to some of you, let, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit because I want to be careful how I say this. I think there's times where there's great reasons to not be at a small group, and I'm not chastising all of you because you're not there. 
But I think we make great priorities on top of great priorities and great priorities and needs, and then it becomes where we're not even committed to something. Um, I, I don't think you realize how important you are and valuable you are to the small group. Um, when you're there, you're telling that person that you care about them. When you're not there, it means that they're not important to you. Do you understand that? So when you're not showing up five or six or seven or eight times um, because you have different priorities and things going on, you're telling them that, that they're not a priority, priority to you. They're not important to you. See, if, I think we need to change our mindset. I think in the church itself, we come to get served. We come, if we don't get the things we want, we go somewhere else. Um, this happens on a regular basis. We leave small groups to be able to find what's best for us. Um, you know, it doesn't work to, to what we want. But what if we were going to small groups for the benefit of the other people in the group? Just for them. That we're there to serve and care for them. If that was our priority, I think we would look at small groups a lot differently. We would try to come when we can. Obviously, we get sick. Obviously, we have things that come up that are difficult. But I don't think you understand what it's like when you have a small group leader who spends two to three hours getting ready for a, a, you know, a practice and trying to, to get ready and search the word and get ready to teach. And four or five people don't show up and, you, and you're not there. Sometimes you're preaching or you're teaching because there's certain things you're like, boy, I can't wait to preach this. And I think this is the Lord is speaking to this person. I want them to be there. And then you don't show up. And what about that person that really needed you that week and, every, and four people decided not to show up and then you didn't have it. They had no one to go to. I'm not trying to sit here and chastise you, but I want to challenge you. Who are you serving when you go to small group? Who are you serving when you're coming to church? Are you just serving people that are your friends? Are you looking at the people that are coming in here that are hurting, having a hard time, somebody new? Are we inviting people that we're supposed to, putting our needs aside for others, to love others as ourselves? I want to challenge you with that. Um, and, and think through that. Maybe, maybe you have good intentions and maybe you can't come. And I know some of you can't always come. But I just want to challenge you. And I, want, I wanted to say that because I wanted you to hear how it feels on the other end. Uh, that is difficult for people. And I'm not saying it from my side. I've heard this from several people. Uh, many people over the years. I had a small group where we invested. We said, you know what? We promised to be there every week. We're, it doesn't matter. We're going to be there for one another. And if we can't make it, then we're going to get out of the small group. Because we invested not just for ourselves, but for one another. There was one guy who constantly didn't come. And, and you could see everyone getting upset. It wasn't, it wasn't that they were just upset because he wasn't theirs, because it seemed like he didn't care about them. There was a deep hurt. So when we show up, we're showing that person that we care and we love. Let's continue. To so having deep and rich relationships, we need to find commonalities in the things of the Lord. We need to have humility, and we need to love one another as <laughs> ourselves. We also need to have, uh, we have to persevere through conflict. How many of you can say that your greatest conflict in a relationship was that your dad was trying to kill your best friend? Anybody? Yeah, I would say this is probably the probably one of the hardest conflicts you could possibly have in a friendship. Uh, Saul professes to, uh, in, in uh, 1 Samuel 19, we start to see Saul comes out and says, Hey, I'm going to kill David, Jonathan. Jonathan goes, whoa, 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 no, 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 this is not okay, Dad. And, uh, and, and Saul comes back and says, okay, I promise, I'm, I'm going to make a covenant that I will not kill David. So Saul, or, or Jonathan leaves, he's excited, dad listens to him, he knows all the confidence is there, he goes away, and then three times in the next day or so, um, Saul tries to kill David. So David is kind of freaking out at this point, not knowing what is going on, why is this happening? So you see this conflict that's coming, uh, coming at verse, uh, 1 Samuel 20, 1 through 17. So, so David kind of comes to him and says, why is your dad kind of killing me? Why is he trying to kill me? What is he doing? 
I, I can't imagine how Jonathan felt at this point. Uh, th this whole passage in itself to me is kind of this conflict resolution or dealing with a conflict that's difficult. Um, you see, in David's mind, in Jonathan's mind, he's got this conflict between his dad and his best friend that he, had, he made a covenant with. Covenants were not, a, they weren't small. They weren't saying, I'm going to commit to something and you break it. It was, you're going to live your life to this covenant and you will do everything it takes to be there. And so Jonathan made this covenant and he loved his dad. Uh, and he didn't believe that his dad would do this, uh, you know, across him. He would, that he would do this to him. Uh, you see in verse 2, or right before in verse 1, 20, verse 1, says, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged you, your father, that he's trying to take my life? Jonathan says, Never! You are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without confiding me. Why would he hide this from me if it's not so? He's frustrated. He's angry. He's upset. He's in the middle. David, David's like, your father knows very well. You have favor in, in my eyes. He said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he'll be grieved. Yet it surely as the Lord lives, as you live, there's only one step between me and death. And so Jonathan has a choice here. He can, he can decide to leave. He can decide to say, I'm not listening to you. Uh, what you're saying, I, I'm not going to go down this road. I don't think it's okay. Um, and he can walk away. I love Jonathan's word. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. It's not easy to say to a person that knows that his dad's trying to kill his best friend. Think about that. How people are going to see Saul soon. And how everyone knows how Saul has kind of gone off his rocker. And my dad's gone off my rocker. It's not easy to... to to take this, but he did. You see this passage, there's this conflict going on, and uh, it keeps kind of going back and forth, uh, but Jonathan and David kind of walk through it together. And part of this is, it's pers to persevere in conflict, there must be a willing to trust another person. And this, this took deep trust, not just in Jonathan, but David. David had to trust that Jonathan was not going to take his father's side. Uh, would have to trust his life on Jonathan that he wouldn't just betray him and go to his, his dad and tell him where he's at and kill him. And Jonathan had to trust David that he was telling the truth that if he was lying, look what would happen to him. You know, he'd betray his dad and his dad would probably kill him or, or, or tell him to leave. There, there was a deep trust that they had to have in this relationship. They resolved the conflict by the trust. My perception as a pastor, um, on a regular basis, we see conflicts pretty often. And it seems like when we get to conflicts, we kind of leave. Uh, we, we either leave the church and go somewhere else, or we struggle with somebody and we kind of walk away and we kind of, you know, wash our hands and we stop. Uh, when friendships get difficult, um, when they get hard, we kind of stop in the middle and we, we don't go any further. Um, I, I, we see this, uh, sometimes we, we actually talk to pastors when somebody comes into our church and they had conflict. We want to know what's going on. Why? We want to be a part of seeing uh, change. We don't want something to be just left aside to deal with those issues and those trusts and those uh, problems that are going on. Um, I, I want you to raise your hand if you're married under 10 years. So, out of you, how many... Um, how many of you no longer have conflict in your marriage? Keep your hands up. Put your hands back up. How many of you don't have any conflict in your marriage anymore? <laughs> you're, you're not under 10. Don't try. Okay. Over 25 years, or under 25 years in marriage, raise your hand. Have you guys all resolved all your conflict? If you have, keep your hand raised. <laughs> no way. I'm going to push to 50 here. Anybody up to close to 50 years of marriage? Raise your hand. All right. Have you resolved all your conflict? If you have, keep your hand risen. You know, Bob, you, were the old, you two were the only ones that I thought could be close to that. I can see that. I think we were bad, but I can, yeah. Um, if, if marriage relationships take that long, uh, it didn't take that many years to work, and you're 
beside each other every day. How long do you think it takes to get a relationship to work? It doesn't stop just after one or two times of struggling. It's constant dealings and issues with our sin. We're dirty people, man. We have a lot of issues. We all do. Every one of you comes from back, backgrounds that have difficulties and struggles and trials. And we have to deal with those issues. So I, for me, it's amazing. I feel like we're quick to, uh, not necessarily in this, in this time frame today, we, we you know, quickly take rid of marriage when conflict is too difficult. Um, but I think in our relationships with our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, we should continue to persevere. If we persevered, we'd see something amazing in it. I had a friend who was just the absolute opposite of me. Loud, obnoxious, not afraid to say what he thought. Um, he made me uncomfortable half the time. And then I lived with him. And we started to, to deal with issues. We fought all the time. But we fought because we cared for each other. We trusted each other. That was the most connected relationship I've ever had. And it's because we persevered. We trusted each other. He's the only one that I ever felt comfortable about. Any deep-seated thing that I was scared or worried that I would even be thinking or worried about, I felt comfortable with him. Because I, I had complete trust in him and knew that he would take care of me. I think it's the same way when we look at this as well. You know, as, as Christ didn't give up on us, uh, uh, we fail miserably every day. But Christ continues to persevere. I just want to challenge you. I want to challenge you on that. Your relationships. There's great relationships that maybe have been broken, and there's no reason for it. Because as Christians, we have Christ that can help us to walk through it. We have the Holy Spirit to teach us how to walk through, through things. This whole separation of churches because of little things should not happen. We should be able to resolve issues together as one, not afraid to uh, show our stains, uh, to walk through it together, to be humble, to be not afraid, to be open and honest. I want to go to number four. Another reason um, that can help us to have a rich relationship is we need to be strengthened. We need to strengthen one another in God. Uh, 1 Samuel 23, 15 through 18. I'm going to read this for you. It says, While David was at Harash in the de desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Harash and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will, ne you will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul, Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Jonathan went home, but David rem remained at Horesh. You know, this conflict is still coming on. You know, Saul is still chasing him. He doesn't know what to do. And his friend comes, and he strengthens him in the Lord. What an amazing, it's simplistic, it's not crazy, but it means a lot. Um, he didn't just bring him to the Lord in the sense of, you know, reminding him of things. He reminded him of the truth. He told him the truth that God already said, that, that he would be king at this one point. It's the same way with us, that we want to bring people to the word, to the truth, and, and who we are in the Lord. To strengthen it, I don't think anyone of us should look at this and say, this is impossible for me. I think, um, you know, John Piper once said, uh, don't ever think that a man is so strong that he does not need to be strengthened in God. Don't ever think that someone is so far above you that you can't be an instrument to give strength. I, I think this is one of the greatest and most important aspects. Every one of you have been brought together by God to this church to care for one another. Just because you're older doesn't mean you can't help the young. Doesn't mean you're young, can't help the older. Doesn't mean you're married or single. You don't have a place to be able to take care of one another. We're here to strengthen each other in the Lord. Just think if we all did that. What if every one of us called each other this week and helped each other? Asked, how's your walk with the Lord? Sat down and tried to figure out how we can help and prayed for one another. Do you know how strong this church would be? 
There wouldn't be a lot of strands that would be broken. It would be everybody helping one another. And it would be just strong. We'd be maturing in our walk with the Lord. We'd be able to do more in our community. We'd be, more, be able to do more um, in our relationships, in our friendships, in our jobs, because of the, the strength that we're getting from one another. Everyone is a part of that. Young, old, everyone. Single, married, widowed. All of us are a part of that. And I think sometimes we need to pray and ask God, how do you want to use me today? Remember, it's not about you. It's not your gifts, your abilities. Every person in this Bible, Moses, everyone, you can look at them. They didn't have a lot to offer until God said, I want you to do this. And when God puts it on our heart to do it, do it because he's going to do it through you, not you. It has nothing to do with you. It's all to do with him and being obedient and trusting him. Last one, I'm not going to take too much time on it. It's just uh, we need to keep our commitment. Um, as I said earlier, covenants to us aren't really a big deal. Uh, I, I think, man, I, I break them often to say I'm going to do something. I'm not good at keeping that commitment. Um, but we need to keep our commitment uh, to, to follow through in it. And, and I see, we see that when Jonathan passes away. Jonathan said the only thing he asked of David was, you know, I, I know my family's going to die through all of this, but, but I'm asking you to protect my family. And so his son, Mephibosheth, no, no, hold on. Mephibosheth, I can't say it, uh, was his son, was Jonathan's son. And through thick or thin, it didn't matter what was going on, it didn't matter if David's life was, was in turmoil and it was falling apart, David took care of it. He's just, just going to call me. Uh, math. Math. We'll do math. Um, he took care of him. He did whatever he took. See, he didn't do it just for, for math, but he took care of him because of Jonathan and his covenant. He did whatever he could uh, to keep his commitment. And I think we need to do that as well. If we're going to say we're going to be in a, uh, a small group and we're going to commit to it, commit to it. If you say you're going to do a ministry, commit to it. It's not just for me. It's not for Caleb. It's for the people that are there with you. It's the people that you put more on because you're not going to show up. It's, it's the people that are going to miss you because they needed you and you weren't there. So these are some of the things that I think are important to, to help us to be enriched. I want to... Give this from, from Larry Crabb. Uh, he wrote this in his book, Connected. It's a great book. I'm starting to read it now. Um, it really talks about um, what it means to connect. And honestly, I don't think we understand how to really have good friendships. Um, I think some of us are so busy focusing on ourselves, we have no time for others. And some of us are so focused on care, taking care of others, we're not allowing others to take care of us as well. Let me read this. I have strong reason to suspect that Christians sitting dutifully in church congregations for whom going to church means doing a variety of spiritual activities has been given resources that, if released, could powerfully heal, heal broken hearts, overcome the damage done by abusive backgrounds, encourage the depressed to courageously move forward, stimulate the lonely to reach out, revitalize discovered teens, uh, discouraged teens, and children with new and holy energy, and introduce hope into the lives of countless people who feel rejected, alone, and useless. Maybe going to church more than anything else means relating to several people in your life differently. Maybe the center of Christian community is connecting with a few. I want to see people connect with a few others as intimately as the various parts of my body work together. As cooperatively as my fingers are working together to write these words, with blood from one heart flowing through each finger and instruction from one mind controlling their movement, the job gets done. If one finger were to suffer a cut, my body would quickly send life-giving resources to the damage site to fight off infection and help restore the finger to, to full use. The church, we're told on good authority, is held together by a supporting ligament. Does that mean the church community can hold me together when my life is falling apart? The church design, is designed to grow and build itself up in love as each part does its work. We're not designed to do this by ourselves. And I want to challenge you today. 
I want you to think, I, I know every of us wants something richer and deeper. And I want you to think about how that looks. Maybe there's people that you can invest in. Maybe it's your small group getting together. That's why we put the small groups together. We don't care so much about the numbers. We care about people getting together. Caleb and I are only two people. Um, we can't help all of you. Um, I love Andy Stanley. One of his most important points when it comes to small groups is small groups is to be preventative. Um, because anyone who's not getting help from other people is in emergency mode. And when you get to emergency mode, it's already too late. Um, people come to us late in marriages or, or relationships and didn't go to people beforehand and get help when it could have been uh, taken care of and not had to fall apart. So I... Uh, it is preventative. Uh, it's there to help you. It's, it's, it's a place to be able to get to know people you might not know and see how God will work that out as well. I just want to, as small groups kind of stop this summer, um, we'll, we'll kind of do some substitute things during the time. But, but I want to challenge you. I, I don't want you to take this home and not, not think about it. But I want you to, you know, if you're in a small group and you're still meeting, I want you to go to your small group and tell one person you want to meet with this week. Maybe there's somebody that you feel that there's commonality. There's somebody that you want to love as yourself. Somebody you want to be challenged to, to think forward first and put them above you. Who is that person? Think about it this week and, and see how that can change you. You know what I love about Acts 2, 42 through 47 is the fact that it says, when they did these things, more came that got saved. People want that deep, rich relationship. As we want it, the world wants to see it. When they see it, they come to Christ because they want that as well. I know there's several stories in here that people came to Christ because they were brought into a community um, and they were loved and cared for. And because of that community, they came to Christ. I want, I want CBC to be that. I want us to be so connected to one another. I'm not asking you to go to every person in here and try to take care of everyone. Find one person this week. Look at your small group. When you go to small group this week, how can I take care of my small group this week? What can I do to love them? Maybe somebody in that group is having a hard time and you can focus on them this week. Maybe you can take them out to lunch and pray for them and sit with them. So I hope David and Jonathan's rich relationship is something we can look forward to and we want to see as well. Let's pray. Lord, it seems uh, sometimes friendships, you know, are just what they are, and they're important, but not as important as work, not as important as uh, family and our kids, but Lord, it's valuable. It's, it's valuable to what you made us. You have brought the bride of Christ together to be one. We're not separate as a bride. We're all a bride together. Uh, we're a body and unity. You have brought us together to be able to live life, to be focused on you. We have, we're here to help each other to grow. So, Father, show us how to do that. Let us uh, not be fooled. Uh, if we're alone, Father, let us seek others. If we know others are alone, Father, work on us to care for them and be there for them this week. Father, work on our hearts to, to want deeper relationships. Let us work hard and trust you in it. Just thank you, Jesus. Amen.